there are two things to do. First, I want to finish the discussion of despair. Remember, I left you with this kind of cliffhanger to figure out why you were all in despair, or almost all, anyway. Uh, anyone who doesn't has, if you haven't been in despair and saved, pulled out of it by a defining commitment, you and you're in despair. And I might add, because somebody just asked me a question um, right before I started talking, which showed some not quite understanding, because you could still be in despair even if you had a defining commitment. Uh, you, you ought to know that. Who who is the the, the, the we know from the course? has a defining commitment and is in despair anyway. What? Uh, Kierkegaard. No, well, who knows? I mean, I, that's too, too hard to say. Yeah. A night of resignation, right. And, and, and I was thinking of the French woman. She's as shortly, in dis, shortly in despair. She gives this moan of utter sadness. That's not just ordinary sadness. We'll come back to that in a minute. And she's in despair. The only people who aren't in despair are people who were in despair, have a defining commitment, and have faith. That is, don't go into resignation, but stay in the defining commitment. Now, the... And while I'm at it, why don't I get, explain something else, which I was going to explain later, because it seems silly to go back and repeat it. The, we have to distinguish despair from anguish. Somebody asked me about that after class. That's important. They are really almost opposites. Despair is the experience we talked about last time that you can't relate the factors. You can't get them together. They're a contradiction. And, you, and on your own, nobody can get, them, can get them together. And therefore, another way to put that's why everybody's in despair. I'll come back to that. that let's get anguish taken care of. Anguish is the positive feeling that the night of faith has when the night of faith has a defining commitment, <clears throat> doesn't f flee from it and make it safe in resignation, but holds on to it, seeing the sword over the head of the beloved and getting more and more involved as if it's the surest thing of all. That's anguish. Remember, anguish is the very criterion of a night of faith. The, the, the night of faith also, suspending the ethical which every night of faith does, because once you've got a defining commitment, you've got a higher authority in your life than the ethical, which may not be calling you right now to do something that you wish you never would have to do and couldn't stand yourself after you did it, but might at any time call you to do something like that. And so the person who has a defining commitment is also in anguish about, of, it, of the possible teleologic. So there's, I just put it this way, there's an anguish over the possible sword falling, uh, which is over the head of the beloved, that's the vulnerability. And there's the anguish of the possible call to go against the ethical at any time might come. And that's the other, that's the anguish of, of problems one and two. I think that's all I want to say about that. So, and then the anguish, well, I, I need to finish. Bliss is obviously a very, very miserable feeling. Anguish is a tension which you're in, but it goes with bliss. It's, it's not an awful feeling. It's just a feeling that, boy, things are weird. There are things I'm doing that I can't understand how I'm doing them or why I'm doing them, but I know I have to do them feeling. And that's, you couldn't have bliss without that. Uh, okay, so so just and everyone who's got an unconditional commitment and is a knight of faith is in anguish, and everyone who doesn't have an unconditional commitment or is an uncondition has one but doesn't have faith is in despair. That's get the, that all cleared up. But now we're ready to talk about the issue which which is where we left off. I just want to make sure now that uh, that is where we are. Yeah, okay. Now, the, we were just saying, how, why, why should we believe we're all in despair? Why not say, look, not me, I'm getting the most out of my possibilities, I'm happy, I don't feel anguish, but I don't need to, I, and I don't feel despair because everything is, everything is going extremely well. Well, the, the answer to that is on your handout, and it's very sort of brilliant and ingenious, and 
I think, probably convincing. Um, so let's read it. This is on the same side of the handout as the chart. And, the, and I'm, I'm quoting Kierkegaard from the other translation, just because I already had it on the chart and I didn't want to do the page all over again. There's no important difference. Uh, so the common view, I'm going to read it, overlooks the fact that when compared with illness, despair differs dialectically from what one usually calls sickness because it's sickness of the spirit. And this dialectical, I mean, dialectic is this funny word. I don't really know how to explain what he means when he slings it around. He talks about the dialectic of eternity in a minute. Uh, does anybody know why he keeps saying dialectical? I don't either. I bet it's something Hegelian. It makes absolutely no difference. You could just cross it out every time you come across it. I think that's a good idea. Then it, then it makes more sense. And this aspect, properly understood, brings further thousands under the category of despair. If at any time a physician is convinced that so-and-so is in good health, and then later that person becomes ill, then the physician may well be right about this person's having been well at the time, but now sick. But despair isn't like that. Once despair appears, what is apparent is that the person was in despair. In fact, it's never possible at any time to decide anything about a person who's not saved through having been in despair. That's what we've been talking about. For when whatever causes a person to despair occurs, it is immediately evident that he's been despair, in despair his whole life. This is, that's the interesting move. When someone gets a fever, on the other hand, it cannot possibly be said that now it is evident that he's had fever all his life. But despair is a characteristic of the spirit. It's related to the eternal. And there is something of the eternal in it. I just got rid of dialectic. Okay. Now, what, what goes on here? Do, does my voice sound too loud to you or just to me? It sounds okay to you. Okay, then I won't mess with it. Um, so, now, what, what's going on there? Well, you've got to understand more the phenomenology, the description of the feeling of despair. And, and then you'll understand what he's saying. Uh, what is it to say that despair has got eternity in it? Well, he says it means that when you're in despair, you realize you always were and always will be. But what is that? Well, now... I think to figure that out, you have to take a sort of running start and not just use despair in a kind of sloppy way, but realize it has a very technical meaning for Kierkegaard and probably really in just it does. Despair is a very, very special mood. And you want to distinguish it from, say, being sad. If you're sad, uh, melancholy, as people used to say, then you know that it's temporary, that you'll get over it, that you, you've been sad before, and after that you're happy again. Now, it could be worse if something awful happens to you and you're so miserable that you, you don't think that the rest of your life would ever be the same and you could ever be happy again uh, because this has made it impossible for you to be happy ever again then you're really miserable. I don't know what the word for that is. That's, that's really bad. That's about as bad as it can get, short of despair. That's not despair. Now, the tricky is the thing is to understand that. Despair is the experience that it's always been impossible for things to work out for you. They didn't just start being bad. They were just plain bad all along. Your way of relating to the factors is bad. It won't work. It can't give you a meaningful life. So when you run into despair, you get an experience that your whole life, that well, your life isn't working now. You get that experience. That's too bad. That's sad. Maybe that's miserable. But you get the other, the more experience, and moreover, the kind of life you got could never work, never make you happy, never give you a fulfillment. Now, we're lucky we have the French woman because in the movie, when she makes this moan of utter sadness when she's looking in her mirror in the bathroom uh, in the hotel at the end of the movie, what does she understand? 
Does she just understand that, oh boy, it's not going to work out with the Japanese guy, isn't that too bad, and I have to go home to my husband and keep the, what's really important all about me secret, isn't that too bad? But at least I've saved the German, isn't that great? Is that what she's, is that what she's got? A moan of utter sadness, the utter in there part, is it's sadness for all the past and sadness for all the future. It's, it, she's realized that she's in a kind of trap, that her life is set up so it can't work. If she gives up the German, she makes her life meaningless and loses her identity and regresses to lower nature and lower immediacy. If she holds on to the German the way she understands memory, she, she has the German always in front of her and she can't relate to anybody else, even somebody as, as utterly understanding and sexy and good-looking and lovable as the Japanese man. And that's bad news. And so, in other words, she sees her life is literally totally hopeless. And that's despair. And now it follows, of course, from what I've just said, that if despair is really like that, that your life isn't working, your way of living can't make you happy and meaningful, give you a meaningful life, then what is your attitude toward your past when you were happy and everything seemed to be going well? What would have to be your attitude toward your past when you, once you get this experience? This is the eternity in it. You, you weren't really happy, exactly. It must have been an illusion. If you've got an experience which says, right on the face of it, your life isn't working and it can never work, it also says, and it has never worked. You can't have one without the other. Uh, and, that, and now, the pieces are all in place to see what it means to say that you are all, or almost all, in despair right now. He's, and, it, and how it's related to discovering that you've got a disease right now. Well, if you discover you've got a disease right now, you, you don't have to discover that you had it all along. But if you get into despair, what do you discover? That's right. And that's the future part. What about the past? That's right. Your life was hopeless all along. You were in despair all along. You just repressed it, covered it up, distracted yourself or something like that. But, and now what does that tell you about you right now? It's all a very brilliant and ingenious argument. You, everybody sitting here right now can at any moment in their life experience despair. And then what will they understand about the, themselves sitting here right now? Yeah? It better be clear. I'm saying it in, in simple words of one syllable. What will you know about your life right now if you get into despair ten years from now? That you were in despair right now. You were just covering it up. You were under the illusion you were happy and your life was working. It couldn't be because uh, ten years from now you're going to discover your life never worked and, and uh, never could and never will given the way you've set your life up. Now there are several sort of... Once you see that... They're, they're sort of footnotes to say, it may never happen to you. You may be lucky enough to get through life without ever hitting despair. Just like you may be lucky enough to get through life with your defining commitment, always safe, even though it's vulnerable, the sword will never fall. But the very fact that you could at, could at any moment experience despair is enough to show that you're in despair right now. Right, because at, at, if you could at any moment experience it, then you could always, then you will re always be able retroactively to experience it, and nothing guarantees that you aren't going to experience it some moment in the future. Except what you can talk and say, ex what could guarantee you that you wouldn't experience despair in the future? That it wasn't just a lucky fluke if you get by life without experiencing it. Yeah, that you're a knight of faith, and you got, and you have your defining commitment. And you've been in despair, because everybody is in despair before they get a defining commitment and before they get to be a knight of faith. But, and so the only possible... So nothing except that could guarantee that at some future moment you may retroactively realize that you're in despair right now. And that's what he wants to convince you of. And, that's, and it does seem, I think, right to follow if you believe that despair is this kind of special retroactive 
and proactive, that is eternal for all time, for your life, forever in your life, experience. And I think people do have that experience, and seeing the Japanese lady having it is a pretty clear case of it. Now somebody wanted to say something. You still want to say something? Yeah, but once you have the, the experience, you don't just think, maybe I was always, always in despair. By the nature of it, you must have been in despair right now. It's stronger than that. Because, I mean, it's this picture, you, you, you sort of see that this is the same as the defining commitment eternity, only upside down. I mean, the defining commitment eternity was you get to an X, an instant, in which your whole past is empty and your whole future is settled in terms of the person or cause that you're involved with. Well, if this X was despair, you'd get to the understanding that your whole past didn't work and you were miserable, and no matter how far the future goes into the future, you'll always be miserable. And once you see that, it, it follows that no matter how good you feel now, it must have been an illusion. I mean, this isn't just a prediction or a, a guess. It follows from the nature of despair, according to him. And it sounds very plausible and, and interesting to put it, to see it that way. There was one other thing I was thinking to say it for that might help. Just a second. Uh, oh, well, I could give you another example from Kierkegaard that might help. You need to have some kind of feel for this. I mean, maybe you'll know somebody like this, or if you don't, you might be able to make up somebody else who has some other version of this. I mean, Kierkegaard talks about a kind of person who feels that they were dealt with badly in their childhood, in whatever way. Uh, their sibling made life miserable for them, or some other such thing. And they feel that they, they won't accept the, the world or themselves unless that gets fixed and made right. They want the past to be changed. But they, of course, that's a bad idea because they can't change it. What they could change is the future and they could get over it. But that's, they don't want to do that. They don't want to say, well, it was all right, I got over it. They want, they, it's too outrageous. It's like losing their, their identity. Their identity has been to be miserable. And so they're stuck being miserable. They can't, they can't change what they what they want to change, and they don't want to change what they can change, Kierkegaard says. I'm sure people, there are people in therapy like that. And uh, that's, that's just a more sort of simple example. But, and that person might go through stages in which sort of temporarily they're very happy, I don't know, playing their computer games or surfing or whatever. But behind it all is this sense that their life is a total disaster. Any, any question about that? Uh, okay, then let me see where we are. Uh, I think that's... I, I keep thinking there's something more to say about this eternal, but I think probably there isn't. If somebody asks a question, they'll probably point, to me, point me to where I'm missing something. Yeah. Ah, that's a wonderful question. She, I don't know. Uh, I, that is very interesting. Let me think about that. I think she, she well, no, I have to think more. Uh, yeah. she be yes. Oh, absolutely. See, in her case, it looks like her despair of utter sadness starts at the moment she uh, takes up resignation as the way to deal with the death of the German. And before that, it looks like what? We might want to say she was blissfully happy, but the trouble with that is uh, we, it, it certainly won't, Kierkegaard won't like that and because uh, he says you can't be blissfully happy until you've been in despair and been cured of it. She hasn't got the imagination to think of what would happen if she lost the German. But that lots of people like that, Kierkegaard says, that 
don't have it. The only way, only get this problem of the loss of the other person in a, when it becomes a dire necessity, as he puts it. The other person's just already dead. So what was her state of mind before? She. That's fascinating. I just don't know. And I think that's wonderful to have something to think about like that. Yeah. Uh, well, the, sure, I don't know, but let's stop, I'm not gonna, unless that's going to help me understand her. I, I, I mean, the, is the, the, the despair oughtn't to be different once she has understood that she's... Well, the, the, I think probably... The, what did I? I, I say still on. <laughs> you, I think what you have to do is to try to realize that Kierkegaard didn't need the strong claim he was making. And then we have to sort of fix him up. I mean, nothing falls apart in his position if we understand that at the, by the time she's got herself into this state of resignation, she's in despair, and she understands that her whole life from there on, from the moment the German was killed on, has been hopeless. And she, and, but that's easy. What, and what does she understand about the life before? That it was terrific, that she was happy. Uh, I'm really puzzled. Yeah. She thinks that she realizes now that it's hope, it was hopeless because she didn't know it. That's what Kierkegaard would say, but why should we think so? Here she got a defining commitment. We don't know awareness, but if we, 10 years from now, if we have the experience that makes us realize that we were in Okay, good. I see your point. She's saying, well, but wouldn't she realize that even when she was happy, seemingly happy with the germ and that was illusory, she was in despair and she didn't know it. Well, that's certainly, that's what Kierkegaard claims. That's what we'd like to show. But you can't just assert it. You've got to, so what did it, what would it look like for her to be in despair while she was happy with the German? That's half the question. And how does it look to her now? Does she now think that her time with the German was miserable? I don't think so. So, uh, so it isn't as if she... Now she's in despair. She ought to discover that she'd always been in despair. Uh, I, I'm just groping to understand this. Let's see now. She, she's always been in despair in a very remote way, which I could explain, but I don't... And I will, but I'm not convinced it's strong enough. I mean, she obviously was related to the German in a way that put her sort of to the vulnerability of uh, this uh, resignation, which is a kind of despair. She certainly wasn't related to him in the right night of faith way where she saw the sword over the head of the beloved and loved as if it was the surest thing of all. She just didn't think about it the fact that the German might die. All she thought about is she'd go to Bavaria with him. Now, that, that means that she was sort of potentially in despair, exposed to the possibility of despair, because she had this defining commitment and she had the wrong way of dealing with it. But that's hardly strong enough to say that she was, that her life wasn't working then. Her life was set up in a way that in, in the end it wasn't going to work for her because she didn't have faith. But it's hard for me to get any content to that. I mean, how did it feel at the point that she was with the German? Surely she had... It, 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 you have to say if you're Kierkegaard, well, her sense that it wasn't working was way covered up by, much, by how much fun she was having with the German. But that just doesn't feel right to me. Uh, I'm stumped. Uh, nobody have any help. Yeah. Um, I think they they, that was sort of fun. She did, when you see that in the movie, she's running there on her bicycle, all happy and excited, and it's just part of the. I mean, it, it, they didn't feel that it was an evil thing they were doing, and so they had to hide it. They felt it was a good thing, but the time was evil, and so they had to hide it. Uh, I, I'm just going to. I just don't know what. I mean, my, ten, my temptation is to go out on a limb and say that there's a, 
there's a place for some kind of uh, situation where somebody hasn't yet realized that their way of life won't work. They haven't realized it unconsciously and covered it up. They just haven't realized it at all. And you can call that despair if you want to, but it's now got a funny thing because it seems so remote from the sense that things aren't working and will never work, which is the real feeling of despair. I'm getting nowhere. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's the best you can do, I think. What that feels like, I don't really know. It isn't, it somehow feels, feels, feels odd to say that I was uh, under an illusion covering this up because it never has seemed, would have seemed to have occurred to her. Uh, and therefore to say she was in despair is very sort of, weak thing to say about her, namely that she was living in a way that once he died, her life was ruined. Uh, and therefore she was sort of vulnerable to despair all along. That's what you're really saying. And that's enough, that is despair, to be vulnerable to despair. Then she should retroactively realize that not only her life hasn't worked since the German died, but her life wasn't even working while the German was around. And I don't get any sense that she did realize that, or that she should realize that. Help. Um, uh, could it be that her despair has a, a deeper root, like a more universal root, than, uh, than just the fact that the German died from, like, her life was not working in that sense? Because if everyone is in despair, um, not everyone has this experience of Good. Well, then we would have to figure out what her kind was. That's why I gave you the example of the person who doesn't want to live in the future because they want to change the past. That was supposed to illustrate something which I didn't make clear. I mean, everybody's got some way of taking a stand on the factors which denies the contradiction or fails to resolve the contradiction. But there has to be some specific way. It's, I mean, it's true that the, the factors are such that there is no right way to relate to them by yourself that would get them together. Satisfy one side or the other. That's right. And that I'm just trying to get the feel for what it's like to feel that the factors couldn't be gotten together in your particular life, in your particular style of stand of, of taking a stand on them and that you never had them together and you couldn't possibly get them together and even looking back on it you can see that you were failing to get them together that's what I concretely don't get okay some people everybody is, I'm glad everybody's trying to help this is amazing to find a new puzzle every year there's got to be some new puzzle yeah could it be that later she realizes she was in despair the whole time they were together because after he dies she realizes that that's the like the highest form of existence for her, and she never reached it while he was alive. Like she never had a defining commitment to him while he was living. Ah, uh, but no, I don't think that's true to the you know. It looks to me like she did have a defining commitment to him while he was living. Otherwise, why would she go into this total grief and this 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 turning him into this ideal thing, which she had to keep, or else her life was be meaningless. Uh, it. It just doesn't seem to me to fit the picture. I mean, she just fully devotedly involved in love with him, ready to go where he wants to go and ready to think they're going to live the whole left rest of their lives together and that's going to be fine. No, I, and, uh, you, you can't, you, I don't know what more you'd need to think that she had a defining commitment to him, except, well, not even, I was going to say, except to see the vulnerability and worry about it because Kierkegaard admits this is the way Kierkegaard, his objection sort of gets into Kierkegaard and worries me, about, and should worry Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard admits that you can be in a defining commitment and not be aware of the sword hanging over the head, not be aware of the vulnerability, therefore not needing to have faith, not, think, not thinking when you're getting more and more involved, 
with anguish that you're doing something crazy. I mean, once you get all that in there, you, you're, you're, you're saved. And, and it, but if you don't have all that, then I don't know what you're... Why, I, I don't see why that person should be said to be in despair. I think I should go back to the drawing board and bring you a report if I get, if I get any further. Uh, or you can come to office hours and tell me about it, and, and either at this one or afterward. I just think that's wonderful. It's very good to have hard problems like this. You'll learn something. We'll learn something if we ever get it figured out. We may learn Kierkegaard just makes a mistake, that, that he can't make the strong claim he's making about despair, or we'll learn that, that he does get it right and I'm making a mistake. Either way, it's very, it'll be illuminating. Okay, let me, let's go on. Uh, so, so despair is a, a world-defining and eternal experience. It's like the negative version of a defining commitment. And uh, people who discover it discover that their whole life has been meaningless and hasn't worked no matter how much fun they were thinking they were having. Uh, You'd have to think that your happiness was illusory looking back. Uh, And you'd have to see you've never been happy and you never could be happy. And okay. Now we're on to the next issue. Uh, Then the next issue is how sort of how, how come this is the way we are built, that we're built looking at your chart with these two sets of factors which are contradictory and can't be gotten together, either by denying one or the other, which will certainly not get them together, which is the Greek way, or by holding on to both of them, which can't get them together because there's no way to be detached and involved, infinite and finite, on, uh, temporal and eternal, all at the same time, just on your own. Uh, and that makes, remember, of course, I just should, but, but there is a way to do it, all right, and that's on the other side, just to remind you, because there's so many things in the air right now, the middle of the long thing. So, what is it to get out of despair? Maybe this is a moment to say that first. Is, are, you ab- are you really stuck in, in despair? Not if you get the, re- the relation to, to relate itself, if you relate to yourself, or the relation relates itself to itself, that is, you take a stand on being these factors, in a way that, what? Can you tell me, what do you have to add to get it to work? You, you, you can't do it by yourself. What, what does it take to do it, to, to get the factors together? To be finite and infinite, temporal and eternal, possible and necessary, all at the same time. You all know this, I hope, or I should go home. Uh, what? Faith. Well, faith is a part of it. Faith is a part of it, all right. But that's. But it, it, what is it that, that you have to do that requires faith? To put your question back one step. You have to what? Yes, you have to relate yourself to yourself by relating to another, something or other. That's the middle paragraph on this page one. If the relation which relates itself to itself has been constituted by another, then of course the relation is the third term. And the relation, skipping a little, relates to that which has established the whole relation. So you... Or you that you have to relate yourself to yourself by relating to another and just not and relating to another not just in any old way but with infinite passion as a defining commitment and then that creates you as a new being gives you an identity puts the you become you get an infinite passion for something finite you get it in time you get something that, that in your life is forever and in, with necessity, in necessity, that with something fixed in your life, you can then have both being fixed, something settled, and, some, and a lot of possibilities up for unsettled. All that happens, but it only happens if you relate yourself to yourself by relating to another. And then comes her point from back there. Uh, and how do you do that? Well, there are all kinds of wrong ways to do it, you know, fanatically and uh, uh, resign it with resignation. But there's one right way to do it, and that's what? 
seeing the sword over the head of the beloved and do what? Love anyway, defenselessly, more and more, as if it was the surest thing of all. And now, and what do you need to be able to do that? Faith. You have to believe that even the impossible is possible, that this, this relation is absolutely secure and totally vulnerable. And you can't, and if you believe that, you believe something utterly incomprehensible. That's the paradox of existence. If you try to say, in terms of beliefs, what the Knight of Faith is doing, you have to say, well, look at that. The Knight of Faith believes that this is absolutely secure and absolutely vulnerable. And the Knight of Faith has to say that to himself if he thinks about it. But he, he can do something he can't understand if he has faith. He can do something paradoxical. That's, and that's it. Uh, then, then the two parts of the self will be related and everything will be okay. That's the cure that, we, that, uh, that uh, the sickness unto death is, his, is, is a disease, a special kind of uh, dialectical or eternal or whatever kind of disease. And the cure for that kind of disease is unconditional commitment in a field of faith. Okay, that's, that's where we are. So Christianity, and now comes this interesting issue, that Christianity, I think, I don't know if Kierkegaard thinks this, but I imagine he does, is in a certain sense the cause of the disease and the cure of it, where the disease is despair. Now, the tricky part, we've done the cure of it a lot. That's just what we just went through. It, it tells you to get a defining relation and that there is a, that faith will make it all work out fine. But in this, I, I mean, it, it's hard to know just to what extent Kierkegaard thinks th this about the, the, the question is, does the self always come with these two factors that have to be realized or else it's in despair, even if you're a Buddhist, even if you're in Greece? Or I think he thinks that Christianity, I hope he thinks, that Christianity invented the, the problem. I mean, because Jesus was there, who was the God-man, who told people that they could have an infinite passion, should have, called them to have it. Then they discovered there was something like bliss, which is getting the two factors together. Nobody in the ancient world had bliss, according to Dante. They all, the best they could do was limbo in the, in the afterlife, where they wandered around and talked to each other and took it easy, and it was very pleasant. But bliss is a, is, Bliss goes with despair. Only a view of the self, which is so amazingly uh, contradictory and yet put togetherable, gives you the despair if you don't put it together, and bliss if you do. And where did you get this self? Is it just sort of biological? If it, given your DNA and mine, we all have uh, these sets of factors? That seems very unlikely. What You get it because in our tradition... The Hebrews sort of set it up that the mind and the body are equally essential. And then God became man, meaning that Jesus went around saying that he was God and man and showed somehow that you could be, put the, put the, be eternal and temporal and all that. And once you see it, that is, I mean, it's a little hard to follow this now, but somehow it gets put in the culture by the Christian community, and then the Romans become Christians. And in the background, a whole new understanding of what, how, how hard it is to be a human being and how terrific it is if you get it right. It's harder than any ancient thought or the Buddhist thought or anybody like that ever thought, and it's more blissful if you get it right than anybody ever thought. And, th and that's the peculiar sense, I think, in which Christianity is the disease for which it is the cure. And now, that's probably what it means to talk about when you relate yourself to another, that is, relates yourself to what has established the whole relation. That's the same thing as the phrase, you, uh, you're grounded transparently in the power that constituted the self. These are just two different translations of the same idea. With the, so... So Jesus, I think you have to think, established this 
complicated kind of self. It's like discovering that there's something that you really, really like, but you never noticed you really, really liked it. But once you discover you really, really liked it, you discover you can't live without it. And then you're, in, you're, you're both in trouble, cause that, but that's also a great new exciting thing. Well, if you just imagine that now, push to the limit, there is something called bliss that you discover that, that you can't, that you can have. And once you discover you can have it, you get to be a bliss addict. And everybody in the culture is a bliss addict, either because they're directly raised as Christians and and, and told all this story, or because it's all over in the literature, it's in the language, it's in the history of the culture. In this peculiar sense, and everybody raised in the West anyway, and only maybe, it has this, this, this kind of factors. It's been established by what? Well, I think by Jesus. I mean, if it's true that he's the first one to come around and say, you can have an unconditional commitment which gives you bliss and brings you together and doesn't make you choose, like remember the Greeks do, either you'll, let's, let's satisfy the body part or let's satisfy the soul part. This thing doesn't make you choose. It says you're essentially body and soul. You're essential, and you can have both, even though they're contradictory. Then, then you, you see that there, that, that there is some sense in which, on this Kierkegaard picture, Jesus has got to be the power that posited it, but and posited this kind of self by saying, have an uncondi- and by what now? There's one little piece more missing, I think. I'm just sort of trying to make up the story that I think Kierkegaard must have, though I can't give you any pages where he has it.